We're next going to hear about the short-term energy outlook from the Energy Information Administration. We have with us today Howard Gersbeck, Deputy Director of the uh, Energy Information Administration. Uh, as second in command at EIA is the agency's top career official, and he's involved in all aspects of analyzing and disseminating independent and impartial energy information to promote sound policymaking, efficient markets, and the public understanding of energy and its interaction with the economy and the environment. For the last 35 years, Dr. Gunspeck has worked extensively on electricity policy issues, including restructuring and reliability, regulation affecting motor fuels, vehicles, energy-related environmental issues, and economy-wide energy modeling. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Gunspeck to the podium. Well, good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank David and Pat and, uh, you know, and the NASIO staff, I should say. Uh, EIA greatly values its relationships uh, with the states, which I think have deepened in recent years. And I think it's been a good thing for the states, and I think it's been a good thing for EIA. Uh, I'd also like to thank EIA's uh, short-term energy outlook. Adam and I often joke that our job is sort of like the job that Vanna White has on the <laughs> Wheel of Fortune. You know, we turn the cubes, but someone has to make the cube. And, uh, you know, the short-term outlook team led by Tim Hess, uh, who I think is here sitting next to Pat, uh, you know, it's actually, he's relatively new to this. Uh, he still benefits from the mentorship of uh, Tank Litterdale, uh, you know, and, and gets tremendous support from the entire CO team, which is a large, uh, team at uh, EIA. So I thank them all. So unlike, uh, you know, I'm a big fan, well, not a big fan, but I'm a fan of Game of Thrones. And, uh, <laughs> you know, where the watchword, I guess, for the last four years has been winter is coming. And, uh, you know, but it hasn't really shown up yet. I have a feeling it's going to show up in this coming season. But, uh, but I think here, you know, whatever we think about forecasting, be it weather forecasting or energy forecasting, I think winter is definitely coming. Uh, now, exactly how the winter will be, we've, we've heard all, some uh, good ideas from uh, Michael. And we certainly, in our weather work, we draw heavily on what NOAA does. We do not, uh, to use a colloquialism, roll our own when it comes to uh, weather <laughs> uh, forecasting. So. Uh, See why they don't let me out of the <laughs> office very much. So, uh, so let me start with the bottom line uh, up front. Uh, you know, it looks like uh, consumers will be paying uh, less for heating fuels uh, this winter than last. Uh, probably not a surprise what's going on in energy uh, markets. It's a combination of prices and consumption levels. Consumption levels come out of the weather, which is why you heard uh, the weather presentation. And uh, both the weather and uh, prices uh, seem to be uh, lining up for consumers to pay less. So again, you know, you can read this faster than I can say it. So really for all, everything but electricity, prices are going to be lower than last year. Uh, you know, Michael did an excellent job I assume, because I don't know much about weather uh, forecasting, but, uh, you know, we expect it to be warmer than last winter. He was comparing more to normals, and I think we're looking, most people's frame of reference is, what did I pay before, what am I going to pay now? Uh, so east of the Rockies, it's warmer. Uh, you know, we count things in terms of degree days, which relates to temperature. Degree days are a pretty good indicator of consumption levels. Uh, but in the West, it's, it's colder, we, you know, based on the NOAA forecast, colder than last winter. Again, not necessarily. Last winter was quite warm uh, in the West. So combining the, the first two bullets, you have the projected changes in the, uh, in the household uh, expenditures. Uh, you know, the oil heat uh, consumers are are, are going to see the biggest percentage reductions in bills from uh, last uh, year, and the propane followed by the propane folks, and then the natural gas uh, users. 
So again, you know, we talk about terms of percentages here. I think in the STO itself, you'll actually find absolute numbers for average households by uh, region. Uh, the reason we focus on percentages here is because the absolute numbers are really a, a broad guide, but fuel expenditures for individual households are highly dependent on the size and energy efficiency of individual homes and their heating equipment, the thermostat settings, uh, very localized conditions. So again, we do provide that kind of average information, but what really matters for most people who have the same house they had last year, probably have the same thermostat settings, and et cetera, is the percentage uh, change. So that's really the sort of the bottom line up front, as they say in the military where I've never served. Uh, so, of course, forecasting weather, you know, we have high respect for our colleagues uh, at NOAA, but we often ask the question, it's very, their job is very difficult, so we ask the question, well, what if it's colder? Uh, and what if it's warmer? And these are the, sort of the, the answers to those uh, questions. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that even if it's 10% colder than the forecast, which is a lot colder, you know, across the, the, the nation as a whole, uh, you know, we still find decreases uh, relative to last year in uh, expenditures. If it's warmer, obviously, you get an even bigger uh, reduction in expenditures. So this one is just a reminder. I, I don't think it's news to anybody who attends meetings such as this, but it's a very different mix of, of heating fuels across the, uh, the nation, and, and that particularly in the Northeast, there's a fair amount of heating oil, but really, really nowhere else. It's relatively small nationwide. There's a lot of natural gas everywhere. Uh, there's a lot of electricity, uh, increasing amounts of electricity everywhere, uh, but a lot of electricity particularly in the South. So just some background on what people in different regions uh, might be looking at. So here's a summary of, of uh, prices of, of heating fuels. Uh, I think these are the delivered to residential customers heating fuels. So producers are saying, we don't see prices anything like that. Well, you know, there's a lot of distribution costs and things that are reflected in these prices. But the nice thing about this graphic is it gives you a sort of a, a long run view of how this has evolved from winter to winter going back quite a way. Uh, you know, what we're looking at this year is on the far right hand side. And, uh, you know, clearly uh, propane prices and heating oil prices, the red and the brown, uh, at the retail level are a lot you know, have come down quite a bit uh, from uh, what we've seen in recent years. Uh, delivered natural gas prices are down, but by a smaller amount. There's a lot of distribution charge uh, and transmission charge, but mainly local distribution charge in delivered gas, natural gas prices. So those don't move all that much. So, uh, So unlike, uh, I'm looking at my colors, but the colors on the screen look very different, so I'm sure I'm confusing you, so I'll have to look at the screen. So on, uh, unlike Michael's presentation, and, and Michael said this, uh, you know, we focus on a, on a six-month uh, winter period, October through March. Uh, in some parts of the country, you know, people are turning on their heat, uh, you know, in October. But, but December through February is the core, obviously, of, of the... Uh, heating season, so we, we show you kind of all of it, and uh, the, 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 in each monthly area, the, uh, the yellow bar is the, uh, the current, uh, you know, really based on NOAA, uh, but for our six-month period, not their three-month period. And you can see that, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, lower than uh, certainly lower than last year in, in, you know, in most months and lower than the 10-year average uh, in uh, most months. So a relatively warm uh, winter, which again helps on the consumption side. So 
again, I mentioned at the start that you know we really are trying to work more uh, with the states and and to provide enhanced winter fuels information for policymakers, markets, and the public, both now and in the future. So this is like like two of Dickens's Christmas present and Christmas future. I don't have Christmas past. So we're so we're continuing. Uh, with the you know the heating oil and propane update, we have the expanded uh, state heating oil and 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 propane uh, price survey that was expanded last year, following uh, propane aganza uh, the year before. Uh, so now we now cover 38 states. Uh, we have a winter fuels page, which is a one-stop shop. So one of the things we found is like sometimes EIA could be like the Walmart of energy numbers. I don't shop at Walmart very often, but when you go into Walmart, I don't know where to find what I'm looking for. So the idea was to put all of the energy uh, winter information we had on one page. And I, I think it's been pretty well received. And I, you know, we get some favorable comments on that. We have electricity data browser and recently introduced energy disruption maps, uh, which have you know, the energy infrastructure, all different types presented in different layers of the map. Uh, with actually a live feed of some of the storm tracks that NOAA provides. I don't know if it's Michael's part of NOAA or a different part of NOAA. But, you know, the idea is uh, useful information and, again, state profiles. So, you know, this is stuff we've done in the last few years. And now, uh, coming attractions. So, uh, we, we actually have started collecting and are, you know, doing something really very different for EIA, which is uh, presenting data on hourly electricity load, projective load, and interchange for 60-plus balancing authorities in the United States. And we're going to provide that information two to three hours after each hour. So it's like a completely different, clearly we're not sending people paper surveys, and it's a sort of a business-to-business -business relationship that we're establishing uh, with the uh, balancing authorities in this uh, country. Uh, in the ISO areas and, and RTO areas, a lot of this is already available, but the whole country does not have ISOs and RTOs, and this will cover the whole country. And it's actually being like looked at uh, and reviewed by experts. Now, uh, updated regionalization of the weekly natural gas storage report. I, I guess I could have put in the previous page that we've started collecting uh, uh, more natural gas production data from the states on a monthly basis recently. Uh, we're going to add, uh, uh, we started crude by rail, those of you who follow EIA, we're going to add propane by rail uh, data uh, probably early next year. Uh, we're developing a densified biomass survey, wood is used in a lot of places in the country. Uh, Rex is going to have uh, more information. and. Uh, a lot of our, a lot of the things we're putting on our website, we're trying to make them available to everyone, really. But particularly, we have states in mind to be able to embed that information on their own sites. And uh, as we, I think, in the very near future, we'll, we'll we'll not only be able to embed a static chart, but we'll be able to embed, in other words, you embed a particular chart, say that has weekly price data for your state. And that chart would automatically update as the next week comes out. So that's a very, I think, a, a nice thing that the states and others might be interested in who don't want to sort of refish uh, for their data each time. Uh, so again, here's a picture of, of what we're doing uh, on the natural gas storage regions. Uh, so those of you familiar with our weekly natural gas storage report, uh, traditionally it has three regions, the producing region, the west, and the east. Uh, you know, the producing region, you'll notice that Pennsylvania, the second biggest producing state, you know, obviously not in the producing region. So we had this sort of vision of sort of, you know, and it was historically correct that the gas production occurred in the, in the, in, you know, in the Gulf and the consumers were in the west and in the east. But more and more that's changing. So in addition to changing our data in terms of collection, collecting production data, we're also re-regionalizing the uh, weekly natural gas storage report. And that probably will come in 
We're working with our respondents on that. Obviously, it's very important to make sure that they have things right, uh, so we have to make sure we have the right data, but it will, my guess will be definitely before the year end, uh, before we get into, hopefully before we get into the core winter as identified by uh, Michael. So with that little, little advertising section done, I guess, uh, you know, my thought is to uh, go back into the specific fuels and uh, so natural gas. Again, you read better than I, you know, talk, but, you know, inventories are really robust. Production is also going to be higher, you know, this, this winter than last winter. And that makes a big difference because, you know, 1.8 BCF a day more, you know, over 150 days, let's say, of five months of winter, you know, you're talking 500, you know, not 500, you're talking maybe 300 BCF more production during the winter than we had last year. So in addition into coming in with these big stocks, you have more production to support uh, consumption. Uh, again, we think uh, wholesale prices likely to be quite uh, modest by historical standards. Uh, there are some challenges, I think, in the, in, in the Northeast. Uh, so again, this is more of a regional view of what was presented uh, earlier. You can see that the, the, big, the big savings, so to speak, are in the uh, you know, consumption levels. We do have higher consumption in the West than last year, but consumption levels lower every place else, uh, prices generally lower, uh, total expenditures lower. Uh, in all regions. So here's the uh, average, you know, residential natural gas prices. You, you know, people in this room don't obviously know this, but the, your, your prices are actually lower in the in the winter than in the at the delivered level, which is the top line, the red line, or whatever color it is in your on your screen. Uh, you know, the winter prices tend to be lower because the fixed charges get amortized, if you will, over a much larger volume of consumption. You know, when you're, when the summer, when you're running your stove and possibly your, your water heater, uh, you know, you're not using nearly as much gas, so that fixed charge looks, looks bigger. Uh, you know, the bottom is the, is the uh, Henry Hub uh, spot price. So again, the difference represents the fact that, at least for natural gas, you know, distribution charges in particular and transmission charges to a lesser extent are, are pretty big uh, components of what people actually uh, pay. I guess the other thing to notice kind of here is that you do get some, you know, surprises. So you'll notice on the, on the, on the bottom line, uh, the 2014 uh, winter, uh, two years ago, uh, you know, we had a pretty good peak there in uh, February, and that was a very, very pretty cold winter. And if you go back even further and you have Eagle Eyes, the 2011-2012 uh, winter, you know, as we were getting into February and it was a really warm winter, you know, Michael was saying which winter was a really warm one. It was 11-12 that was really warm. And people started saying, gee, we got a lot of gas in storage and we're mostly through the winter and natural gas prices really, really crashed a lot. So the weather does matter for this story. And uh, this is our, again, our outlook of the, of the Henry Hub price. But you can see that, uh, you know, the, the implied by the markets, there's a very big uncertainty around that uh, shown by those dotted green lines. Uh, you know, that's based on the value of options and futures contracts, sort of inverting a standard pricing formula. And again, the story that I told you about you know, 2014 and 2012 kind of tells you why the markets, you know, show some pretty healthy respect uh, for the uncertainty of uh, prices. That's nothing new, really. And here's a storage situation. And, uh, you know, in our forecast, working uh, gas storage at the end of October will be at the highest level ever. It will be close to 4 trillion cubic feet. Uh, at the end of October. Now that clearly depends on October weather, uh, which is out of Michael's forecast, but he says he's whispering warm. 
So, so we're going to be right if he's right. Uh, so let me turn to uh, heating oil. Again, the story here is one that everyone who goes to the gas station or drives by it, and you don't even have to wear your glasses since the letters are so big, or the numbers are so big. Uh, you know, the, the spot prices uh, for, for Brent, which is, you know, we, th we at EIA believe that product prices are largely tied to global crude markers, not domestic crude markers. There's some further discount domestic prices below uh, Brent. But they're lower than last winter. And again, crude oil prices are very uncertain. We'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, distillate stocks are quite high. Uh, you know, 15.8 million barrels above the same time last year. I'm focusing on the Northeast because, again, earlier on, that's where the heating oil's used. So that's kind of what matters. Uh, distillate inventories are also high across the globe. Uh, you know, refineries were running pretty, pretty heavy in the gasoline season. They were making good money on gasoline this uh, summer. Uh, so you were getting good prices, and they were making good money at the same time. And so uh, th that generated a lot of distillate uh, as well. When you run a refinery, you get all the products. And again, there's been a slowdown in distillate consumption, I think, in the rest of the world for a lot of reasons. So unless things get very, very... This question came up for Michael as well, this notion of what's going to happen in Europe. Uh, certainly matters for heating oil markets, because uh, there's those ships are going across the Atlantic carrying the stuff back and forth. But unless it's severely cold in both the Northeast and Europe, uh, ample supply should be available. So again, uh, yeah, this is just showing the here you'll notice the, uh, you know, the gap between the, the wholesale price and the retail price somewhat lower than for natural gas. I, I guess trucks to haul this stuff around cost less than building pipelines that run into each house. That's the lesson I would draw from that. But you can see that, uh, you know, relative to last winter, both the wholesale and the, and, and the retail prices uh, are are forecast to be lower. And again, here are the, the distillate inventories in the Northeast are at the highest level since 2011. That 2015 line is, is where they are. Let me turn to propane, electricity, and then I think we'll be done. So propane. Propane inventories much higher than year ago level much higher than the five-year average. But one thing to keep in mind is that most of those propane inventories are on the Gulf Coast, distant from the main areas that use propane for heating. I'll show you a chart. It's quite interesting. Propane production has been rising and is, you know, 100,000 barrels a day, 0.1 million, higher than last year. So... Again, it's, it's like with the natural gas story, the fact that production is up, even if you know, stocks are high, but also production is high. Uh, propane supply continues to adjust to recent uh, infrastructure changes. You know, people always talk about fighting last, last year's war. This is like two years ago's war. Uh, but uh, you know, the Cochin pipeline was reversed, and there was a lot of concern about that last year, although it didn't turn out to be much of an issue. Uh, you know, there, there was rail capacity added last year uh, to move propane into the areas previously served by that. There's even more rail capacity uh, added this year uh, for propane supply to the upper uh, Midwest. And uh, again, good availability from Canada to feed some of that. So I think a generally good situation. Uh, again, here's the propane expenditure picture. Uh, you know, focused on the Midwest and the Northeast, which is where uh, we're, we're really, you know, using the stuff. And again, pretty significant uh, declines, both in consumption and in the average price. So our last fuel, and it's a, you know, the previous three, you know, mainly used for heating, uh, electricity, sort of an all-purpose fuel. Uh, 
Everyone uses electricity, but not everyone uses it. Oh, what do I have here? I have a, something that I missed here. But this is a good slide, so I like this one. So, because uh, it got out of order here. So here's the uh, story about propane inventories. So the 2015 number, you know, in the Gulf, on the left-hand side of this thing, is really high relative to historical standards. If you look at the inventories excluding the Gulf, it's still high by historical standards, but it's not the, the I don't want to call it a blowout, but it's not the, the huge, you know, departure from the range that you see on the Gulf Coast. So again, you know, in thinking about propane, looking at the national inventories, you know, wouldn't give you necessarily the right picture, but the inventories are very strong even outside of the Gulf Coast, and you have this extra Gulf Coast production, and you have, uh, sorry, you have this extra production of propane through the winter. Uh, and so I think, I think you're in a pretty good situation, but it is important to keep in mind the regional. So now we really are going to go to electricity. So again, uh, the Northeast has kind of been seeing some price spikes uh, for electricity, particularly New England, and that's uh, the past two winters, mainly because of constrained natural gas supplies. Uh, certainly the industry's working on it. Uh, you know, ISO uh, New England is trying to provide incentives for the wholesale market to help maintain adequate fuel supplies. And the forward contracts, you know, show some of the impact of that, perhaps. So uh, at this time last year, the forward contracts for January for on-peak power were trading at, a, at a $190 per megawatt hour. And this year, they're trading at 90. Uh, you know, 90 is still a lot. You know, at a wholesale level, nine cents a kilowatt hour is a lot, but it's better than 19. Uh, system operator still warns that the loss of, of major non-gas unit or natural gas supply disruption could be challenging. Uh, in the future, you know, th they're going to do more. It's like, like us, I guess. Maybe winter really is coming in 2018. I don't. I don't know. But uh, you know, they are working on a on a strategy to kind of deal with this thing more, more permanently. So here are winter electricity bills. Uh, east of the Rockies, generally going to be low. So here the prices aren't changing that much. So what really drives the electricity bill relative to last winter, for, you know, is going to be the consumption level. Already mentioned in the West, we think based on NOAA's work, which I've hopefully characterized correctly, we think that even though it may be warm by whatever compared to the average, it's colder than last winter, so we expect consumption to be higher, and that's going to push expenditures up. But every place else, uh, consumption's going down, so total expenditures going down. I should point out that we can't differentiate the, you know, even in homes that use electricity for heating, they're also using electricity for other things. This is our total electricity bill. We're not trying to kind of piece it apart. There's really no way uh, for us to do that. Uh, again, this is more information about uh, natural gas pipeline constraints into New England. Uh, you know, we will publish alerts like we have been doing when situation warrants. Uh, I don't know, probably not of important, but I won't go into the details of this. Uh, this is looking at some of the efforts to address some of the pipeline constraints. There are there is some pipeline construction going on, but it or went on between last year and this year, but mostly it serves New York and New Jersey, not New England yet. Uh, future developments, I think there is is talk about adding more natural gas pipeline capacity into New England. But again, I think that's, you know, li like everything involving energy, there are controversies surrounding that. But the, but the plans are certainly to think about that. So here's one last look. I, I think this is a good place for many people to go 
this winter fuels, uh, winter heating fuels page. And again, it, it, you know, data relevant to each state on a clickable map, so you don't have to hunt and peck through the giant Walmart of energy numbers. Uh, you know, we actually put links to the updated forecast that, that NOAA produces. And again, every graph can be downloaded as an image or spreadsheet. And they're going to be, again, this, this live feature where you download it once and it updates itself, which might be very handy uh, for many of the people in this room. So again, another shameless advertisement for all of our, uh, right? It's not, it's not PBS. I mean, we're allowed to have commercials. Uh, you know, even they have commercials, right? So there you go. I guess we are like PBS, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, no, this is, a valu this is valuable information because you know where to go you know, to see the things. So again, today in energy, we will definitely run articles as situation warrants. Hopefully the situation doesn't warrant. Uh, the winter heating fuels page already talked about. CO will be updated. You know, there's a thing in forecasting that says if you must forecast, forecast often. Uh, EIA definitely does that. Uh, we will update the CO every month. Uh, monthly energy review is data uh, every month, very comprehensive. State energy portal gets your right to your own state. So with that, I guess I will, I will stop. Thank you. Uh-oh, questions. Hi, I'm Brian Wingfield with Bloomberg News. Howard, um, on page five of the PDF, it looks like that natural gas, heating oil, and propane are, are at their lowest level since at least 2009. I'm wondering if, if you have any further historical data on that so we can just have some size and scope about how, how they're the lowest since what, what date? I don't have the answer in my head, but I'm sure we have the data on our website. And I know that because I'm an old person, uh, you know, I, I, I know that, that natural gas prices, I think, were definitely lower in the 1990s. Uh, but again, I would look it up. I, I, I'm getting myself in trouble by trying to answer as opposed to looking on your website. But, but in something like the monthly energy review, I'm pretty sure we would have monthly data on delivered natural gas prices and delivered heating oil prices going back probably to the late 1970s. So it's easy to find. I'm going to help you write your article. Just not right in here. <laughs> it was one over here. Um, you have a newer, more commercialized like economy program for capacity. Is that the ISO? I think that's the ISO doing it. I don't know who's. Uh, is there a good Tim? Do you want to? Uh, I think we're going to pass it around to other people. The pay for performance thing in New England. Tyler, do you want to handle? It takes a village, as I said at the beginning of my. <laughs> Honestly, I, I'm not that familiar with it, but I understand that's sort of their primary strategy is to ease the constraints um, in terms of uh, mitigating any sort of wholesale price spikes like they had about two winters ago. Yeah. But honestly, yeah, we need to speak with a New England expert to get more information yeah, about we, that. We didn't bring the entire village. I know there's one person on my staff who could knock that one out of the park, but he's not here. I noticed that you didn't have coal in this um, in your overall review of it. Is this all based upon for like on the electric side uh, and the natural gas, since there's such an interdependence between the two of them. What, what are you assuming in terms of the amount of coal consumption that's going to be ongoing during this winter and then, and say, in the future? All right. All right I'm going to try to do this out of my, out of my head. It, it's certainly written down in, in the uh, short-term outlook. I mean, right now, I think this year is turning out to be a, a little bit of a year like, like 2012, where you had these very low natural gas prices, and pure economic dispatch considerations are favoring, you know, use of more natural gas. We also have more, generally speaking, we have more renewables coming in. 
Uh, but we have less hydro because of the California drought. So it's uh, so more non-hydro renewables, but less hydro. But definitely natural gas dispatch being favored over coal. We have a little bit of a switch back toward, I think, coal toward the end of 2016. But, you know, but nothing like whatever historical levels. So context, I think coal was providing in excess of 50 percent of, of generation, uh, you know, as late as, what, 2007, 2008. And I think it actually then started falling down a little bit. But now, you know, this year, I forget what we have. And I mean, someone could speak up. I think the coal share of total generation would be something like 35 percent, roughly. Is that right? So coal consumption this winter about the same as last winter. Now, over time, the, 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 the mercury and air toxics uh, implementation of that, there have been some coal plant uh, re retirements. There will be more probably going into next year. That actually has not, in, in EIA's view, been as big a driver of what's happened this year. A lot of the plants that were initially shut down were kind of low utilization, relatively low utilization. Uh, but over time, that, that matters more. And then certainly what happens with the clean power plan, but again, that's well beyond this, this uh, two-year horizon of the short-term energy outlook, matters a lot. Uh, the Energy Information Administration did a, did a report on the uh, clean power, on the proposed clean power plan, not the final. We did the report in May. Uh, EPA came out with its final clean power plan in August. Uh, so we haven't looked at that. But in the proposed clean power plan report, yeah, there have been some changes, but it'll give you the idea that it has a big impact longer term on coal fired generation. It seems to me one of the good news stories here is the reduction in expenditures because if you take the sum of all the reductions in expenditures for energy, you're really creating some measure of economic stimulus by freeing up consumer spending, increasing disposable you know, income, discretionary income. Of course, that's offset a little bit about you know, taking crude oil prices down and the contributions right. they otherwise make. Is this a pretty significant stimulus in the economy? Yeah, I think, I think it, it you know, uh, I think the uh, so take off my Steo hat and put on my my old economist hat, which I wear more frequently to cover my bald spot. Uh, but on the uh, you know I, th I I think the relationship of you know there's a lot of work done you know with high oil prices and and the economy. Uh, the question is, is that, and, and, and low energy prices, you know, are a, sort of a boon to the economy. The question is, how much is that changing in a world where we import less of our energy and we have, you know, it's, it's pretty easy if you were importing all your energy and you could pay less for it, you know, that would be a great thing. Uh, as, as you point out, there are kind of winners and losers when you're uh, doing things. Uh, my sense is that the general consensus is that on net, it's still a net benefit to the economy, but maybe not as large as uh, some of those, you know, might have been in the past. I think that's one thing. And the other thing is very few people care about the net benefits to the economy. They care about the benefits to them because people are, yeah. And so obviously there are, there are winners and losers. Sir. A quick comment and a follow-up a follow-up question to, to Jeff's. The comment on the uh, uh, pay for performance uh, question around New England, this is really not uh, the related issue of demand response that PGM operates, for example. It's not an impact this winter, but the following winter, we have the FERC Order 745 um, Supreme Court ruling will likely come out next spring, which could potentially dismantle that activity. So for not for this winter, but for the next winter, we have a, we right. have a follow up, I, I think. But to, to are, are, are you providing a forecast on we, the Supreme Court? We are Court definitely to... not. <laughs> <laughs> we are. I think that makes you even crazier than yeah, him and me. I <laughs> definitely not, definitely not. I know better, but we, we will be prepared nonetheless. Um, the, the, the real question is, following up on Jeff, some of the, 
the energy offices in particular have a, a governor's lens, so they have an economic lens. Is there, on the state data pages, are there sort of dollars in the consumer's pockets, estimates by state or by region uh, for the uh, forecasted lower energy prices? Obviously, for producing states, that's a little less relevant, but. So I want to answer correctly, but it's hard because, uh, again, another example of my village not being large enough. There is something called the state state energy data program SEDS uh, that puts out kind of very detailed data on on expenditures by fuel at the state level. Uh, there is a lag in that data. Uh, we are trying to shorten the lag uh, in that data. Uh, I don't think we forecast. Uh, in that, in that data series, but I guess one could piece together based on some of the past ways in which the SEDS numbers have followed energy prices and then kind of, you know, it's like all analysis questions. I mean, you know, you can give, uh, you, you can't give the right answer even if you had infinite time. You know, you can give the best one year answer if you had a year. You can give the best, you know, one month as answer if you had a month. You give the best one week answer if you had a week. If the secretary calls and wants the best one hour answer, he'll get the best one hour answer. So I, th I think it can be done, but we have not tried to piece it together. But it would be a combination, I think, of the state energy data system, SEDS data, plus some of the price change data. Stump the chump. <laughs> Monthly energy review? Well, it wouldn't have state level data in the monthly energy review, I don't think. But it's a good it's a good good data source as well. But I think the SEDS would give you the quantities and the expenditures and then you could take the prices and kind of figure it out by state. Hi, Stephanie Sal with Argus Media. Um, I had a question on slide six. Slide Each six? Other. Yeah. I don't even know what slide six is, but I'll find out. It's talking about the fuel expenditures. No. Expenditures? Yeah. One, two, three, four. I was just curious about electricity because it's showing from the prior winter that there's, um, as I expect, a 3%. It's 3% lower than the prior winter. It was our second year of the polar vortex, but then against the five-year average, it looks like it's a little bit higher. So I, it's 2%, would you consider that roughly flat, or would you consider that against the average? Because yeah, before the last two years, we, we didn't have as much. So, so electricity vortex. prices, I think, have in recent years at the residential level been, been going up, and I think that's you know what's, what's being reflected there. Again, it's a combination of price you know, the, I th which I think is the right way to think about it. This whole presentation talks about consumption, which in terms of heating fuel is very tied to weather. Now again, electricity is, we can't separate the heating part of it from the rest of it, but to the extent that you're a house that heats with electricity and the winter's cold, you're gonna use more electricity. So there's the consumption side of it and there's the, the price side of it. In the electricity case, I think the price side of it Tyler, I will I will make you answer this because I know you know. I think I think residential electricity prices, national average, eh, been going up pretty. With the residential electricity prices, it's actually pretty uncommon for them to fall year over year because uh, there's so many different costs built into the rates that need to be recovered. Um, it's true that there have been uh, declines in the fuel costs definitely year over year, uh, but the residential retail rates also have to recoup increased expenditures and in, uh, transmission investment, uh, new capacity, the movement to renewables, and all these sorts of things. So the relatively flat change in retail rates is actually pretty yeah, good it's, news. It's good, it's been, but, but over the past few years, it's, be, it's been kind of going up, is my sense. Oh yeah, definitely. So there it's actually kind of breaking a little bit the, the trend, I think. I would also remember the same slide you had. Take, take a mic. This is Tim Hess. Just also remember when you're comparing to five-year averages, we, you know, we kind of think about the last two winters, which were particularly cold, but the winters before that were 
also very warm. So it's not, you know, there's there's the effect, there's a baseline effect there on the early winters and the five-year average as well. Right, so particularly the 11, 12 11, winter yes. was extremely warm. That's when natural gas prices really crashed. Just a, yeah, just a caveat. I don't here. even have it here. Damn. Five-year average. <laughs> what? Good morning, Howard. Suzanne Good morning. Watson with ACEEE. Yeah. Um, our research has shown that, in large part, most of the utilities now are experiencing flat growth, in some cases negative growth. Mm -hmm. I wonder how that relates to this idea that the cost of electricity, certainly for the residential customer, is going up. Well, the cost or the price, those are two, uh, two different things. I mean, I want to be careful. I mean, the expenditures, you know, but so certainly I think I'm trying to get this right. I have this different presentation, but in uh, like between 1950 and and 2000, or even 2005, I think electricity use year over year declined only twice over like a 50, we'll call it a 55 year period. And then over the past six or seven years, I think there have been four years where electricity actually use actually came down. In fact, I think overall electricity use is just about at the 2007 level, if it, if it has gotten back to that level. Close? Yeah, really close. So to be your point, there's no question that overall load growth has been really low. You know, but I'm not, uh, can you elucidate? I wonder how that relates to increasing costs for the residential customer. Well, again, there's a different ways of looking at it, you know, I, I think, again, cost and price, or want to be careful about that, but uh, to the extent that if demand was growing, some of the fixed costs might be spread over, the you know, cost of the distribution system would be spread over more kilowatt hours, that might be a lower thing. On the other hand, it's not like consumption has, again, we're close to the 2007 level in consumption, so if you know, if, if demand was down 10%, 20%, 30%, I'd say, yeah, that's having a big, you know, those fixed charges per kilowatt hour going up tremendously. That hasn't happened. I think the explanations offered by, I think, Tyler Hodge about some of the, you know, programs, uh, efficiency programs, which are, you know, I'm not gonna get into policy, but they're good programs, but they cost something. In some states, those show up in rates. Uh, you know, some programs to promote uh, changes in the generation mix, those show up in rates. I think there's, I know in this area, you know, there's been a big focus on reliability, improving the reliability of the distribution system. I mean, they're cutting trees like crazy where I live, which is good, because I'm tired of losing power all the time. You know, but they're trying to improve the lines and improve, and, and I'm sure that gets put into the rate base. So there are a whole lot of different things, you know, going on. You know, renewables, efficiency, uh, distribution system improvements, transmission system improvements, all that is going into the rates. Hey, we got other things to do, I agree. <laughs> but thank you very much.